Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Just Ignore Him by Alan Davis. So this is a memoir by Alan Davis who uh, played Jonathan Creek. He's also a um, regular uh, panellist on the TV show QI. Um, I, I like Alan Davis. He's always seemed like a very fun, approachable guy to me. Um, and I went into this pretty blind and didn't didn't realize how harrowing it was going to be but anyway i'm going to read you the blurb then i'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and i'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end huge trigger warning for childhood sexual abuse okay dane reads in this compelling memoir comedian and actor alan davis recalls his boyhood with vivid insight and devastating humor and 40 years later confronts his past Davis inhabits his younger mind with spectacular accuracy, sharply evoking an area when Green Shield stamps, Bobber Job Week and Whizzer and Chips loomed large, a bus fare was 2p, and children had little power in the face of adult motivation. Here, there are often exquisitely tender recollections of the mother he lost at six years old, of a bereaved family struggling to find its way, and the kicks and confusion of adolescence. Through even the joyous and innocent memories, the pain of Davis's lifelong grief and profound betrayal is unfiltered, searing and beautifully articulated. Just Ignore Him is not only an autobiography, it is a testament to a survivor's resilience and courage. Uh, so, let's go through and check out some tabs. He talks about paramedics, he said, uh, he's talking about, basically he's got this bag of child porn that is from his dad. His dad who's gone a bit loopy now, but um, yeah, his dad basically is a paedophile and his, uh, his stepmother, kind of gave him this bag of printed out child porn that his dad had printed out from the internet and was like, can you get rid of this please? And he doesn't really know what to do with it. Um, so he goes for a drive because he's gonna like dispose of it in the countryside. And he writes this, I like this line about the paramedic, but the whole paragraph is, is pretty good. And bear in mind, this is on page two. So this tells you a lot about, again, he gets straight into it. If I crashed into a tree and was trapped, needing to be cut free, lifted clear and laid on a stretcher, spark out or even dead, then this bag's contents could change my life forever, posthumously or otherwise. He says that that would just be a fantasy to cling to while being shoved into an ambulance by an underpaid paramedic. Is it possible to overpay one? Has that been tried? I don't think it has been tried, no. And yeah, his mother died young. Um, it's, it's weird kind of, and he talks about this, it's weird, the sort of memories that you have. He says, um, Blah, blah, blah. But I don't remember at the, din at the dining table, though we must have had so many meals together, Sunday roasts and tea times. I don't remember a single breakfast with her. All the time she tucked me in, all the stories she must have read, but I don't remember her in my bedroom. I was nearly six and a half when she died. Six years, five months and 16 days, in fact, or six years, 169 days, or 2,361 days, including the leap years of 1968 and 1972. She was born on February the 5th, 1934, and was 38 when the leukemia finished with her, so she would have been a white-haired old lady by now if she lived. But she might have died another way, of course, a vase falling on her head or something. And we get, this is where the title comes from, he says, um, When I was being annoying, not sure how, it just came naturally, uh, Dad would turn to my brother and sister and say, just ignore him. And they did. Dad chewed his food with his cutlery resting on his plate and a solemn expression on his face as the whole family watched Grandstand on a Saturday lunchtime. I would look at him as he masticated faultlessly, knowing he could feel my gaze but wouldn't acknowledge it, and my brother and sister tuned into his wavelength and so I learned that I was to blame for all the sadness, all the pain, all the aching emptiness everyone felt. It was down to me mucking about, not mum dying, not the mutation. It was tough to be ignored. I had to pretend that it wasn't so hurtful that I'd still be thinking about it 40 years later. I'd chirp away a bit longer to keep the silence at bay until my dad ended that with, if you haven't got anything nice to say, just say nothing. On one occasion I said, nothing, 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 nothing. I'm not going to read you the full thing out, but uh, yeah. And he talks about how his dad was a believer in corporeal punishment. He says, when he hit me, he'd do it with the palm and the fingers. At the time, the unwritten rule was that parents could hit, but not with a clenched fist and only in a target area below the belt, around the legs. It wasn't the mild pain of the smack that was memorable though. It was the grimacing ferocity on his face, the tightened up sadness. The speed of his approach was his tell. He tried to make it noiseless, but you knew when he was coming up the stairs three at a time instead of two, like a dog that has stopped barking and is readying to bite. It wasn't really like a dog though. He was not playful, not loyal and not brave. He just had a free hand. The witness for the defense had died from blood cancer, his, his mum who died of leukemia. He says he slapped happiness out of me like dust out of a carpet. And uh, yeah, this bit, uh, I'm going to read it out because I think it's important because it shows you the way that Davis writes about these kind of incidents, but this shit's fucked up, man. Okay. 
I may have been getting changed when he came in. Maybe it was opportunistic on his part. Maybe it wasn't premeditated. Maybe he surprised himself. That we came to be lying on one of the beds together with me naked and him and his wife once was not my idea. The flat hands became very busy as his cuddling developed into caressing, all without speaking. It was a quiet, librarian molestation. I was largely motionless. He writhed and rubbed for a long time. It seemed like about 2,000 hours. He ran his hands over my back and my bottom. His face with some stubble on it was close to mine. Maybe it was the afternoon since he shaved every morning with an electric razor. I didn't like the feeling of the stubble. He didn't speak. He didn't kiss me. It was a bit unpleasant, but tolerable, given how nice it was to be cuddled. If your mother dies when you are six, there is a significant drop-off in physical affection, a catastrophic collapse, an exponential retraction, followed by a flat line. This is our special cuddle. You must never tell anyone about this cuddle, he said. All right, and then this is all... This is, again, very sad. I don't, but I need to read it to you so you understand what you're in for if you pick up this book. Because uh, I went into this blind. I was expecting a funny book. And it is funny in places, but mostly it's harrowing. He says, I kept toys with me under the covers on all four sides of the bed for protection. I was tucked in safely. Teddy was at the top with me. Then I had a blue plastic mouse's head from the top of a bubble bath bottle and a pajama case made by Granny Price, my mum's mum, that was modeled on Dougal from the Magic Roundabout. The four of them guarded me in my bed until the door opened and I would be brought up from under the covers and invited to take off my pajamas by a man in his underpants. After that, I had to lie or kneel naked on the bed and be fondled by those cadaverous hands, those bloodless mannequins, replicas, with the Y fronts visible in the gloom. The library silence continued as he concentrated on his work before he would abruptly rush out. I never knew where he went or why so suddenly. I'm sure I could still discern my father's touch today. If I lay naked in a darkened room and people I've known roamed flat-handed over my back and behind, I doubt I could identify any of them other than my father. Maybe I'd be jolted into recollection if my mother's hands reached out through time and across dimensions, but that particular dry stroke, like someone testing wood for knots, would, I'm sure, be instantly recognisable to me. I bet I'd jump six feet in the air. Eventually, I began to resist audibly and he stopped, presumably for fear of my siblings hearing. The last time he did it, I was 13 and I became erect, which is still unbearably embarrassing. Did he sense it? I tried to keep it away from him, but I was unable to contort myself indefinitely. We were lying next to each other and I was partly on my side and partly on my back. I remember clearly deciding to allow my nubile cock to sink into the flesh of his tummy. He did not flinch or acknowledge what was happening. He made no attempt to flat hand it away, to juggle it about, like half a hot dog sausage between two table tennis bats. After a minute or two of noticeably shallower breathing on his part, he bolted from the room. Normally, afterwards, he would return to his bed and I'd put my pyjamas back on and try to sleep, so it was a shock a few minutes later when he came back in. He leant into me in the dark as I lay under the covers and said, If any white stuff comes out, don't worry about it. It's perfectly normal. And he asked himself here, obviously based on what happened to his mum, he says, If you were dying, would you want to know? I would. I then prefer to donate all usable organs before being dismembered for medical science, with what's left mince sautéed and served to zoo animals in a tin bowl. Ask yourself the question and share your answer at the first symptom of something bad, because you may end up in the hands of people who decide for you. It's difficult to consider it when you're healthy, as the mind provides little space for death planning. My own thoughts turn flippantly to the horror of checking out during the football season without seeing the final table. I hope my close of play comes during the crick season, though not halfway through a test match, of course. Perhaps imminent oblivion might cure me of the sports fixation that has often provided a distraction from harsh realities. He mentions this, which has got a nice dose of irony. At tea, at tea time, somewhat disregarding our little sister, Dad would put on two little boys by the popular children's entertainer Rolf Harris, a song about sibling love by a now convicted sex offender. I'm not sure if there is irony at work here or serendipity, or if it's just that circumstances have revealed the horrific double hindsight that bro brotherly love is not inevitable and that bad men will spend a lifetime constructing a charming facade. And he makes a good point here that I've not thought of, and I enjoy this because um, I'm learning French. He says, old bat can only mean a woman. It's derogatory, of course, arriving with us on a journey from the out of use term fly by night, suggesting witchcraft or its French equivalent, the night swallow, hirondelle de nuit, which implies prostitution. There are no, there are no nice terms for a woman out on her own at night. Uh, because his, his grandmother, um, I think she had like a mental decline. Uh, I think it was Alzheimer's. Um, he says, perhaps she was bipolar, a modern term that wasn't in use then. Why did she come to our house? Perhaps she'd forgotten mum was dead. Perhaps we meant more to her than we realised. Grandchildren can't comp comprehend the deep blue love grandparents have for them, and the memories these little people evoke of the generation in between, who were also once small, curious and alive. No one said to us, your granny loves you more than anything. 
You're the only thing left a reminder of your dear mother, who she misses every day. She is bereft. She and your granddad would pluck from the happy retirement bungalow and travel back to Spartan accommodation by the M11 construction site so they could help look after you. And then granddad died. You're all she has. Give her a kiss and a cuddle. Tell her you love her. Don't roll your eyes. Don't answer back. Eat up the dumplings she makes. Years from now, you'll wish for just one more bite of one. And uh, yeah, he became a bit of a kleptomaniac as a kid. Uh, but this is kind of genius how he gets away with this. He writes, uh, he knew I was capable of theft and of bizarre behavior. On one occasion, he received a free pair of pocket binoculars with a magazine. I secreted them away, then wrapped them in brown paper and put the package among the presents that were hidden under his bed for my birthday. The following morning, after I'd opened everything he'd bought for me, I said that I thought there was another present. He said that there wasn't. And then he and my brother and sister watched speechless as I went under his bed and found the last present. I opened it up to reveal the missing binoculars. Dad remarked that they looked very similar to the ones that had been delivered to him. I said that Granny Price must have bought them for me and I kept them just like that, stolen from my own father brazenly in plain sight. And he finds a bunch of letters that his mum sent to his dad um, when she was dying in hospital. Um, and I agree with his point here, but anyway, he says, I told my sister about the letters and she said she'd like to see them. I scanned them all and sent an email expressing my frustration that mum's condition was kept from her. After she had read them, she wrote back to say that there were two ways of looking at it. Either that mum had died positively, believing she would go on holiday with us the following year, or that she would have died desperately sad, knowing that she'd never get to see us grow up. I'm not convinced she died positively, because I don't see it as a case of know the truth and die sad or be told a lie and die happy. There was a third possibility, that she would have been able to cope with a terminal, pro terminal prognosis, and that it would have allowed her to write the letters that knowledge would have prompted, to have informed conversations with her parents, perhaps her children too, and to have phoned her sister, all those people were also denied the chance to say goodbye. I considered writing an email back to my sister in which I would speculate whether the people herded into gas chambers by the Nazis could be said to have died positively, believing they were going to have a shower. But I didn't want to hurt her feelings with a false and unhelpful analogy. We both lost our mum. I've come to realise that no one sees the world quite the way you do. Even with a great deal of shared experience, there is always a shift of a few degrees in perspective, and no one's pain is ever the same as yours. I mean, I don't necessarily know if I think that's a false analogy. I think that's pretty spot on. So I think this is funny. He talks about um, sexism, basically, um, comparing it to the old tradition of putting a sixpence in a Christmas uh, pudding. Uh, let's see. Da, da, da. If it were November, she'd keep a sixpence back for the Christmas pudding, and whoever found it in their bowl could hope for good luck in the new year. It's a tradition that's all but died out. Nowadays, most puddings are shop-bought, the sixpences were melted down in 1980, and people have had to come up with new ideas about how luck is allocated. The more logical theories consider geography, skin pigmentation, and gender. And he talks about, he's not sure, like, of his dad's sexuality. Um, he says, uh, at the airport, when I called him a puff over and over again, a derogatory term for homosexuals that was in those days far worse than the old-fashioned queer. I was confused about whether my dad was, as people would say then, one of them. But clearly something sexual had gone on between us, which he had instigated and controlled, engineering the encounters for his gratification. It was also clear that it was a secret and that telling anyone would be a disaster for my personal reputation. So it might be best if you could keep it under your hat that you've read this, thanks. It is important to be clear that what my father did to me was not a consequence of an apparently repressed homosexuality. It's not inevitable if you're gay that you will molest and abuse boys any more than a straight man will inevitably molest his daughter. These two things must not be conflated. Adults, gay, straight, or of any orientation do not normally become sexually aroused by children. The child molester acts on fantasies of control, manipulation, and power. Sex is not irrelevant, but it's frequently not the prime mover in these acts. Furthermore, it is hard to properly assess what my father's sexual preferences were or are. Initially, he molested me when I was prepubescent, as if paedophilic fantasies were being enacted, but he then installed housekeepers into the family home, perhaps in part to protect himself from his own urges. He subsequently molested me again when I was pubescent, amounting to hebophilia, an interest in children aged 11 to 14. But his porn collection shows an astonishing obsession with teenage boys who appear post-pubescent, putting him in the ephebophile camp. Were there any adult same-sex experiences? Who knows? He talks about how it's important for a comedian to be able to survive humiliation and he kind of credits his father's sexual abuse with making him able to do that, he says. Um, the nerves I experienced at early gigs were similar to those when I was shoplifting, but I was virtually immune to shame. Nothing could ever be as embarrassing as being 13 years old, stark naked, with my erection buried in my father's stomach as he writhed against me in his underpants. I think about that incident every day despite it being over 40 years ago. No other single moment in my life comes back to me in the same way. 
my capacity for surviving humiliation and embarrassment is considerable, to, ex to the extent that I sometimes wonder if my subconscious seeks it out as a familiar and therefore comforting state. So he says, For 15 years in my 20s and 30s I lived alone, and for many of them I smoked cannabis every day, believing this to be a lifestyle choice, not a consequence of past events. I would drink white wine at the same time and play hundreds of hours of repetitive video games like Tomb Raider, Formula One and FIFA 97, 98, 99 etc. In that numbness with the deadening marijuana, the sweet tasting alcohol, amid the drip 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 of tiny rewards in the games, with an avatar of myself scoring goals for Arsenal, I could slip into a trance-like state of separation from the outside world that, a psychotherapist helped me to understand, took me towards the blissful peace I'd known when breastfeeding. But in health terms, this behaviour was going to kill me, not strengthen me like my mother's milk. It was not helping me to grow. It was fixing me in time and soon the clock would begin to turn back slowly to zero. And I relate to that because I did something similar in my 20s and early 30s. And now today I've got a point on my phone that says I'm 750 days smoke free. And I'm over, over a year alcohol free. But yeah, we're here. So yeah, Just Ignore Him by Alan Davis, obviously a very harrowing memoir. I mean, it's funny in places and it was fascinating to learn more about Davis, but honestly, the, it's pretty much entirely about the abuse he suffered as a kid. Um, it's almost reminiscent of like a boy named it or something like that, you know? Um, it's a credit to Alan Davis that he's able to write about these things in such a way that it, although it's disturbing to you, it doesn't put you off reading it, if that makes sense. Um, and it's a credit to him that he turned out to be as sort of relatively normal and well-rounded as he is. Uh, I gave Just Ignore Him by Alan Davis, probably a strong four out of five. Um, I don't think I can give it any more than that because it's not a book you enjoy. It's a book you feel compelled to keep reading. Um, yeah. Mm. Abusers suck, man. So there we have it. That's what I made of Just Ignore Him by Alan Davis. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.